Testing.
All right, now maybe that gets all of our attention there. Thank you. That was the shortest class we've ever had. Finally, your thoughts all got actually acted on by John there. That's good. Everybody have your Bible open to Acts 25, please, today. Acts 25. And we... Uh, our, our series right now is I make my defense, I give my answer, I offer my argument for the faith. And uh, these are statements that are made repeatedly either by the Apostle Paul or in a more objective sense where, he, where it says he made his defense. Uh, in uh, several cases in Acts where Paul has an opportunity to explain why he became a Christian, how he became a Christian, why he has remained a Christian over all the all these uh, all these years, and uh, we're trying to use these episodes to try to think: what if we're in that situation, and what if we have opportunities either before people who really want to know, uh, before people who are are just uh, arguing against what we believe, or before people where we're actually on trial, how do we talk about our faith in a in a wise way and in a gracious way? And uh, I've mentioned to you that there are five of these trial type situations in the in the latter part of Acts here, and we're at the next to the last one of them in our series today. And we're going to uh, see how Paul talks to a man whose name is Portius Festus. Festus would be bad enough, probably, but Portius Festus—that's quite a name—and we'll. We will uh, try to get to know him a bit today and then try to notice how Paul talks to him. We always want to pray together before we uh, start. I didn't have a chance to give this to anybody. David, you up to this? Okay. Uh, uh, who do you have today that we need especially to remember in our prayers this morning? Any of you with uh, special uh, needs or people you know about? I know about, uh, and I think you guys have all seen the news about Frank Cunningham, 
Uh, Frank is, uh, uh, they moved him back to he and Loretta's home, which is up at, up in the Greenfield area, at Arcola, I think. And uh, he's, uh, he has hospice care now. So please remember uh, the Cunningham family and, and, and uh, Elizabeth, Lily, and their family, please, in our prayer today. Also, Ron Bauer. Uh, Ron is, um, uh, Eddie, Eddie tells me is in the process, maybe, of uh, moving to the St. Louis area where his son lives. Is that still? Uh, okay. And so we want to remember Ron in our, in our prayers as well. Any, anybody else that you know of? Anyone? Okay, sister-in-law um, has to come and have the, a third surgery this Friday. Uh, part of what they needed to do the other day was not, they weren't able to, and, and, and so uh, she comes back and has another surgery Friday, Lord willing. So please remember, her name is Jewel. Thank you. Anyone else? Chase? <laughs> Okay. Next Sunday is Father's Day. Remember dads in our prayers. And then uh, Chase mentioned the people who have been affected by the wildfires up in Canada. And you've, you've, uh, I've noticed some kind of eerie scenes in the news from that as a result of that. And that's just from the ones who get the smoke from it, not from the people who are dealing with the fires, maybe. Anyone else today? A number of our families, are, of course, uh, have the joy of vacation time at this time of the year. So remember the ones who are traveling. Uh, remember our, uh, our group of elders who uh, will meet today. Keep them in your prayers. And then our young people, as the summer time goes along, remember them as well. Dave, we're glad you're able to lead us in prayer. And we'll ask David to lead us now, if you'll bow with us. Heavenly Father, we come to Thee at this time so thankful, Father, for this opportunity as Your children to be able to assemble here today to give You the glory and honor that You so richly deserve. We're so thankful, Father, for the gift of Your Son and the hope that we have in Him. We pray with You and be with the congregation here. Be with our elders, Father. Give them the wisdom and strength to guide and pray that You be with Brother Bill and, and those... And, uh, and Justin and and uh, those father who proclaim the word here, you be with our Bible school teachers, give them the wisdom and understanding to teach the little ones. We pray at this time, Father, that we would take the things of our life out of our thoughts at this time and put our thoughts on you. We pray that you would be with the six that were mentioned. Frank Cunningham and his family, be with Brother Frank, Father, and his time, and be with his family if they need the comforts at this time. Be with Peter, this Brother Ron, and others, Father, that were mentioned. Those families that are in Canada that are fighting the fire, be with them and keep them safe. We pray at this time, Father, as we go into this time of study and worship, we would do so with gladness and cheerful of heart. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. I have uh, thought several times as I've read through these passages in Acts where Paul makes his defense or offers his, uh, the answer for his faith. I thought of the parable of the sower, that the, the Lord's teaching in the first part of Luke chapter 8, the first one of the series of parables. You remember that story where the sower goes forth to sow and he scatters the seed and it falls on different kind of ground. And we learn later on when Jesus explained that, that the ground represents really the hearers and we could extend it, the hearts of the hearers. You remember the different kind of soils that are mentioned in that, in that parable? Can you name some of them? All right, one of them is rocky. It, you know, it's, a, it's shallow soil with a bunch of rocks uh, uh, 
bedrocks under it and it, it receives the seed with, with joy as long as there's enough moisture and it's not too hot and all that. It grows a little while, but then as soon as there's a time of trial or difficulty, what happens to it? Just withers away. <laughs> you know, it dies out. You, can you think of another one of the kinds of soil? The hard kind, the, the, the one where it doesn't, it, it's not taken into the ground at all. It just uh, falls there and lays there. What happens to the seed in that situation? So hard, it, it's not going to be received. The birds come along and gobble it up. Uh, any, any of the third one, Brian, you mentioned one? The good soil, and that's the, the soil which is uh, interested, which is eager, which is receptive, which is rich, and it takes in the seed, and then it grows, and it produces a harvest as such as is fitting in that or proper in that situation, and maybe... 30-fold, or maybe 60-fold, or maybe 100-fold, but it's a big harvest. We left out one kind so far. Thorny, the, the ground which has weeds in it, and, and the seed starts growing, the good seed starts growing, the only trouble is the weeds start growing too, and before long, which one wins? The weeds choke it out, and We'll quit talking about your gardens now, and we'll move on to us. Um, in this situation, each of these, I could kind of, in my thought, kind of make parallels here with different ones, but the point is that the sower knows this. Uh, Paul knows this in this situation, and he, he, he tries to make his defense for his faith in a way which uh, fits the audience, the hearer for it in the wisest way. He tries to speak graciously, but straightforwardly, and he tries to be true and, and rational, reasonable in what he says. Now, where we left him last time is with uh, Felix, the governor in Caesarea. He has Paul under house arrest at the palace of that Herod the Great had built over there. And uh, he has, he's, he's been hearing regularly about righteousness and self-control and judgment to come. If he can be stirred to interest in the good news that offers hope in each of those situations, he would be. However, not all motives in Felix's life are honorable and noble. Please notice two things about him uh, that we're told in verse 26 and 27 of Acts 24. One of them is that, you know, after he says, I'll, uh, at a convenient time, when I have opportunity, in other words, I'll call you and we'll talk again. Well, this went on for two years. And uh, why has Felix not done anything about what he's heard? Well, one thing is, what was he hoping for? Was he hoping for life? Was he hoping for forgiveness? Was he, was he hoping for an inheritance in heaven? Or he's hoping for some money. The reason being, Paul has all these friends. He's taken money to Jerusalem to give to the poor saints there. He ought to be able to raise enough money to pay me to let him go. And that's one. So that's one possibility is material, a, a hope for material gain. What's the other driving intention in, in Felix's uh, heart? At the end of verse 27. All right. He wants to curry the favor of the enemies of Paul. He wants to do the Jews a favor. He knows how badly they want Paul destroyed. So he leaves Paul in prison thinking that these people who've been willing to show such uh, sickening flattery, even in their presenting their case before Felix, will really butter him up now. The, the, the thing is, Felix rule ended. He actually got deposed and he got replaced. And his replacement, verse 27 in Acts 24 says, is Portius Festus. We don't know uh, much else about 
Festus than what this passage tells to us. Uh, he seems to be uh, more, maybe more just, more intending to get something done about Paul's situation, or at least more aggressive and more energetic than his work than Felix was. He does not seem to be as uh, maybe as immoral as as Felix was. Uh, but what he, he becomes the governor uh, or the proconsul about 59 A.D. And his, his time lasts two years, the reason being he dies. And uh, he, he doesn't know what's going to happen, but that's what happened. I wonder if he had known that, how different his handling of Paul's situation might have been. It's a thought-provoking thing. What if I knew how long my time would be? In, in chapter 25 now, notice the, uh, the date, the, the, the time factor that Luke attaches to this to tell us the story. And you kind of get some idea of the energy that this man is investing. He arrives in the province, verse, verse 1 says, uh, which means he came to Caesarea, and then he went up to Jerusalem. He made the... the, the, the uh, the uh, trip to Jerusalem all the way over there, three days later, that tells you the importance that he attaches to good relationship to the Jews in order to maintain order in that province that the Romans have had trouble with. The chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul. Now what does that tell you? It's been two years. He's been over there under arrest at Caesarea, First thing that happens when Portius Festus comes to visit them, a new governor is what? Paul. Get rid of Paul. And they even have a plan, if you notice this. The plan was um, that uh, you, you, if, if you would um, bring him to Jerusalem, verse 3, do us a favor, bring him to Jerusalem, and they have in their mind the same time the setting the ambush to kill him along the way. And remember how Paul got to Caesarea to start with. Back then, the tribune in Jerusalem uncovered the plot that was told to him by Paul's nephew, sneaked him out of town because there were 40 of them who made their vow. Remember what the vow was? The enemies of Paul at the time, 40 of the Jews. Not going to eat or drink until we uh, until we kill Paul, <laughs> and uh, so here is the same. This, this, now, now those guys were not; they haven't kept their vow, but some of the same spirit is still around. So Felix, I mean, I mean Festus is not; he stands his ground. He's not going to do that. He's answered that that Paul is being kept in custody in Caesarea. If they want to go over, he's about to leave shortly. If they want to go over there with him, some influential men from among them, then if there's anything wrong about the man, you can bring charges to him there. And you can see that Festus is intending to do, to follow Roman law, procedure, legal procedure, and he's intending to see that the right thing is done with Paul, it looks like, at least at this point. Now, uh, what happens is, is Festus spends no more than eight or ten days in Jerusalem, verse 6 says, and then goes back down to Caesarea, which is really northeast from Jerusalem, and then he takes his seat uh, the next day on the judgment seat or the tribunal uh, in order that Paul be brought. This is the Roman Bema, which is the judgment seat, the platform where the judge sits. So this is now a formal proceeding. What role does Festus play in this? He's the judge. That's right. So, so Paul has to talk. Uh, in this situation, he's going to be talking to a man who's playing in the role of the judge, as he did with Felix uh, the first time Felix heard him, um, and and that will that will color uh, what he has to say. Paul arrives, verse seven. He orders that Paul be brought. Festus does. Paul arrives. Jews come down for Jerusalem and stood around him. How do you picture this in your mind? 
Here's Festus on the judgment seat on the platform there. Uh, here is Paul brought forth. He still has chains on him, apparently. And then all standing around him are the influential men uh, from among the Jews that have come with uh, high priests and so forth up from Jerusalem. How would you feel in that situation? Threatened? Uh, you'd feel like um, you are, um, uh, everything is uh, stacked against you. There is, there is opposition all around. Would you feel intimidated? Would you feel uh, afraid to say anything? Would you, how would you conduct yourself? And uh, that's an interesting a thing to consider again. So now we know that Festus doesn't know how long he's going to live. Uh, the, the Jews still have their campaign of um, uh, intention to get rid of Paul going on. And Paul still has the need for justice in his own life, but he also has his faith uh, what he knows to be true from the from the Lord. Now, they everybody who stands around him, uh, they they bring what Luke says many and serious charges against him. But Luke also also tells us something else at the end of verse seven that hasn't changed in two years. What is it about their charges? They're many. They're serious. There, you can get an idea of your tone of voice and all the, the tone of voice and all the speakers. What other detail does Luke give us? They can't, they still have no proof of these charges because the charges are unfounded. Paul had acted in the open and publicly and no secret in what he had done. So it's not a question of these are well-founded charges. They're just no evidence. They're, they're accusing him of things that are not true and they can't prove them. How do you answer that? How do you answer that in a way that upholds your faith that's true to the gospel, that, that is loyal to the Lord? Uh, verse 8 is the situation here. Paul, Paul said in his own defense, and I remind you again, this is the word for his own apologetics, uh, his own uh, reason for the faith that's in him, his own answer. Uh, and you get an idea of what their charges are here. He, he has not done anything wrong. So he is speaking for himself and he's upholding the honor of his cause. And he says, I've, uh, I, I've not uh, done anything wrong. First, not against what? All right. First against the law of the Jews, not against their law, which tells you what have they been accusing him of doing. They've been accusing him of the re religious sin or the religious disorder of trampling the law underfoot, which under the Roman situation at the time, their big concern was that there not be riots, that there not be any kind of rebellion going on, that there not be these continuing periods of unrest and disorder where these people are always arguing about their religious customs and causing us Romans a whole bunch of trouble. So this is the first thing. I also have not done anything against what else? The temple. Now, uh, that's where they found Paul, where they arrested him to start with, claiming that they had that Paul had de defiled the temple by bringing a Gentile in there, which was not true. They found Paul there in the temple, fulfilling a vow himself. Uh, so these two things we've heard them say twice already when they have been accusing Paul in, in, in these in these situations. Now there's a different thing introduced here for the first time in the, in the trials of Paul. What is it, the third thing he says? 
All right, not, I have not done anything wrong against Caesar. So who is that and how is this different now? And where is the trial, uh, uh, where is the question of Paul's faith uh, uh, being challenged at this point? First, who is this? All right, he, all right, he's the ruler. Uh, he's the emperor. Where from? Rome. Does anyone, can you venture a guess who he turns out to be at this time? Apparently, if, we, if I have my timing right with it. Probably Nero. And uh, you couldn't have found uh, uh, maybe a, a more unpredictable and unreasonable uh, fellow than he than he was at the time, but where did where did it get you if you were found guilty of crimes against Caesar? That got you executed, didn't it? Uh, is this a religious crime now? This is religious uh, between Paul and the Jews law. This is religious between Paul and the temple of of uh, the Jews God. This, however, is. Paul and the government, right. This is a, a suggestion that Paul is uh, not only causing disorder over in Jerusalem here, but also against Roman rule here. Who else do you know who had such an accusation leveled against him? Who? Jesus. Jesus. And uh, remember how Jesus answered that? All right, he said that before he was on trial. On trial, though, he, he eventually didn't say anything, but he did say something to Pilate in the beginning of this. When Pilate came in and said, are you a king? I, 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 it's as you say, but my kingdom is not of this world. So what dilemma does that put us in when we're trying to give an answer to for our faith in the in the world setting? We're going to have to say to 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 maintain the honor of our cause while talking to people who don't understand always that we're talking about different authorities and different kingdoms than they are often. That's where we can take a clue from Paul throughout this whole, this whole setting here. Now notice what happens then. Uh, at this point, what should have happened given strict legal proceedings? You've got charges made, you have absolutely no evidence, and you have a man on trial who insists that he's not done any of it. He's done nothing against any of this. What should have happened at that point? All right, either evidence or release right and that's been that hasn't changed through this whole this whole ordeal that paul has been through that should have happened but verse 9 now but festus what does it say wanting to do the jews a favor to keep he's just starting his governorship he's only been at it uh, 13 days or so now or 11 days something like that 12 days and he doesn't want to start out with some big riot and these people who can bear a grudge for two years while a guy is in prison i don't want to get on the bad side of them in the first few days of my rule here so like Festa, like Felix, he's, he wants he's, he has a motive that that is beyond justice. Even if he's trying to go through the motions of it, Paul has to recognize that. You and I find ourselves in situations where we have to recognize sometimes this is not our fault. There is more at work here than just trying to find out the truth. 
And then we have to not back off, but to maintain the honor of our cause in a sensible way. Uh, so Festus offers him a deal. What's the deal? All right. How about, Paul, um, if, if you're willing, we'll go back over to Jerusalem. Now, again, what's his motive? wants to do the Jews a favor. And you can stand trial uh, for these charges over there. Now, why was Festus on shaky ground in doing that? Which, these two charges may be involved Jerusalem. But if Paul was going to be accused of doing something against Caesar, where should he have been tried? Right where he was. Where was, Felix, where was Festus sitting? At the tribunal, on the judgment seat. Who was the judge? He was. This was the place where it should have happened. Now, notice what Paul does here. Uh, at this point, remember, he is still defending his faith. He makes his defense. Verse 8 says, Paul said, and notice this. I want to try to try to outline this, and I think always the, the, the verbs might be helpful for us here. Paul says, first, I am. I am doing what? I'm standing. I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal. Where I ought, what? I ought to be tried. I'm right, where I, so is this, is this reasonable? Is this true and rational? Yes, of course it is. And Paul is dealing with the situation there. I have done, what? I've done nothing wrong. None of these charges that they're talking about. Uh, I've done nothing wrong to the Jews. And then he says something that's crucial in this situation. What? All right. As you know. You know it very well. What effect was that intended to have on Festus? Say it. All right. And Festus is being convicted here. He's being held accountable by Paul. Paul is saying, I know and you know what's going on. And what effect would this have on the other people who are standing around hearing what's going on? All these, all these people uh, who are making these many serious charges, the, the, the Jewish influential leaders who were, who were there from Jerusalem, are seeing a man who is not intimidated and who is calling attention to reality, to Festus, but also to them. Um, He's bringing right out in the open that these charges are not honorable and that, that there is no evidence to support them. Now, Paul, having said this, Paul gives the options. He identifies the options. And when we're talking with people in any situation, uh, to be gracious, to be reasonable, to be wise about it, kind about it, but to offer the options, the realistic options in this, in, these, in this case. And Paul, with Paul, there is an if I, what's, what's the if here? And what does this tell us? All right, it tells us in, in verse 11, verse, first part of verse 11, if therefore I am in the wrong and have committed something deserving death, I am not trying to avoid execution. Why is that statement important? All right, I am willing to answer for what I have done. I am not trying 
to, uh, uh, to engage in an exercise of injustice here. I'm not trying to avoid reality. In saying that, though, what situation does he put Felix and his, I mean, Festus and his accusers in? What if they were to hold themselves to that same standard? They would, or they would have to answer for their own lying in a, in a, in a Roman court and their own pressing of, of, of uh, un, un, uh, unfounded charges or their own exercise of injustice. And then he says, but if... What's the other side of this? Pardon? Basically, if none of these things right. are true. Right. Then, uh, if there's nothing to the accusations these br men are bringing against me, no one can hand me over to them. What does that say to Festus? You are a Roman judge under Roman law. You do not have the right without evidence or conviction to hand me over to these, to these accusers. That would be injustice on his part. And then Paul does the surprising thing. What does he say? All right. I appeal to Caesar. I say it that way. Now... This was the right of a Roman citizen. And in the very part, first of this, when Paul was arrested, the way that he got rescued from being stretched out on the rack and flogged was to say to the centurion, hey, is, uh, is this the way you treat a Roman citizen? Remember that? That stopped the whole thing right there. Now, why would this... First, why do you think Paul did this? I appeal to Caesar. I think it's going to be justice there. All right. Justice. All right. And if you think, if you think back through, um, through Acts, if you go back and read it again, you'll notice that Luke has presented every one of the centurions, and in every case where we've seen a Roman ruler, they have... They have tended to engage in a, 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 a just action. You go back and read it that way. And, and Luke is sort of presenting it, it looks like, to, against that background here. So Paul, Paul may think he has a better chance of being treated fairly and receiving justice if he gets out of the hypocrisy of these leaders from Jerusalem who've shown that they are immune to the, being called to the question of evidence and reality and, and to present his, his just case before the emperor. But that would involve a long trip and much more time and all of that. Can you think of any other reason why he might have done this? Eddie? All right. It's Acts 23 and verse 11, where what Eddie is talking about takes place. This is when he was still in danger, uh, having talked to the council in Jerusalem. Uh, the Lord stood by him and said, be, be, uh, be of good courage, for as, as you've testified about uh, uh, the truth about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome also. Uh, the surprise is how he's going to get to Rome. <laughs> and this is the story here of how that happened. Why does this put Festus in a bad spot? I mean, he has to call a... He has to call him for his advisors to, uh, to counsel him on what to do. Uh, he has to confer with them. Why does this put him in a bad spot? 
All right, so he's a Roman judge. This is a Roman citizen. No, no wrong uh, by by this citizen has been demonstrated. My fear, he's not able. All right, first, he's just starting out. This is the first case he's heard, and he can't even decide. He gets appealed to Caesar, to a higher court. That's bad enough. What other part of it is, is, is there here puts him on the spot? All right, that, he's, he's not going to be doing them this big favor he wants to do. That's important, too. But if you're a judge... And someone in your court appeals to Caesar, you have to send not only the prisoner to Caesar, but you have to send what else? The charges. So, what's he going to write? Remember the, 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 tri uh, the tribune back in Jerusalem when Paul's first arrested keeps trying to find out what are they actually accusing him of? What are the charges against him? And he has to write the letter, and he doesn't. It's not clear to him yet. And 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 after all this time, you still have a guy who is hated that that the authorities are determined to to destroy. Who 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 keeps having hearing after hearing after hearing, and after all this time. They can't let him go. They can't say what he's done. Uh, there is something about the answer to the faith which just keeps on being there, whatever else anybody says about it, however opposed to it some uh, are, whatever. It's just a, a simple statement of the reality which calls for a decision on the part of the judge and the accusers, because the one who's accused keeps saying the same thing in a way that's addressed to the situation at the time, the relevance of the, of the gospel. Now, I meant to get on down for, uh, when, when old Festus gets to tell his next visitors about this. It, it clarifies what he has thought of all, of all of this. I just want to mention to you, in verse 16, he explains to Agrippa and, and Bernice, who come down, the Jewish, from a Jewish background, about this prisoner. I gave him the right to make his defense against these charges, verse 16 says, um, after they assembled here, they, then I had the man brought, and verse 18 says, they stood, accusers stood up, and they started spouting their charges against him and the crimes that I suspected, uh, not of the crimes that I suspected, but verse 19, but they simply had some points of disagreement about him, about their own religion or their own law, and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. What's the depth of uh, Festus thinking about all of this at this point? Just, he hadn't done any crimes. There's a disagreement about some of the religious matters about the Jews, and it involves a claim about a dead man that Paul says is alive. All this is going on. That's what Paul has said twice in these hearings before. I'm here because of the resurrection of the dead, the hope of the resurrection. And, and, but the thing is, to old Festus, the, the secular fellow who's not examining himself and who's not, has no basis for, for reality, it just seems like a, just a debate that goes on. And notice that Paul hasn't argued here uh, about the cross in this situation. It, it's not. There, there had a disagreement because Paul says someone came to die on the cross for our sins. In a hearing where the gospel is at stake and where the validity of the faith is at stake, the beginning point in Acts seems to be 
because that challenges the whole framework of reality for everybody present. If Felix had known he's going to die in two years, any thought of the resurrection of the dead would have looked different to him. And it might have led him to think more carefully about the rest of what Paul could have told him. Like, who was this fellow? Why was, was he raised up from the dead? And what's my obligation to him? That would have made a huge difference, I think, in him. We'll come back to the next one of these stories. It may take us a couple of classes to do it, but, but Agrippa and then uh, Bernice, uh, his, uh, who's with him. Who are they? The, and then the, 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 the long defense that Paul makes to them in chapter 26 will be real important. And then we're going to try to draw some conclusions from these stories before we finish our series. Appreciate you being here with us today. Hope the week goes well for everybody. And uh, we'll get ready for our assembly time now. Thanks for being here.